For the last 40 years, I've been an architect, 30, 40 years, and uh, I started out as an, uh, an architect uh, after architectural school, working in different cities across uh, the world, looking uh, for my heroes and working uh, in economies where the where the uh, the architecture was was blossoming in order to get the work. In uh, the early 90s, uh, I was hired uh, by Louis Vuitton, became the co-founder and director of the architecture department, to um, to kind of bring architecture to to that luxury brand. Uh, so I, I became the client in, in a sense, and it was a very different role than that of just the architect because uh, I was the architect and the client. And it was a very educational perspective in the sense that the client really educated um, me about how to do architecture in the same way that I educated them. A real exchange that affects the way we work today uh, with that dual uh, ability, I think, that, uh, that makes our work different. And it's in that perspective that I will, I will show you some things. Um, the other, uh, the other theme for this lecture is really the voyage, and architecture is a voyage um, of the mind and the body. I really want to focus on the, the mind aspect, and uh, not only in the conception of a project of how we understand architecture, but also in, um, in, in how people experience architecture and, and what that means to them in, in different roles. And I've divided that up into three very kind of simple categories, quality, mystery, and magic. Uh, of which I will elaborate. Um, and instead of uh, the last three days where we've all seen a lot of projects examined in detail uh, from the beginning to the end, I'm going to really try to focus on pieces of projects um, that, that look at these themes. So it will be a little fragmented around these themes to, to prepare you. Um, first, uh, first of all, what is luxury? It's a, it's a question that we're always asked. Uh, we say we specialize in luxury. We do not specialize in stores or hospitals or houses. Um, we, we do all of these types of projects, but we do it in, in the, in, under the guise of the envelope of, of luxury. And uh, for us, that really means customization. Um, but l luxury has a couple different perceptions. I think one of them we call absolute luxury, where you have uh, icons that uh, are kind of collectively agreed upon as the the things that uh, people accept as luxury, caviar, uh, the Rolls Royce, or, or diamonds, um, private jets, private boats, or whatever. Uh, and the second being relative luxury. Um, things that are luxurious to uh, someone, um, an individual or a group of individuals, um, or even a company, as the case may be. So instead of designing a chair, designing a chair specifically for somebody, uh, would be considered luxurious. Um, and it's in, in that perspective that we, we'd like also to outline the work. Um, in the sense of diamonds, for example, the idea of having somebody craft them and formulate them into an object uh, that's specifically for somebody. Um, that can be done with jewelry, obviously. It can be done uh, with, with clothes uh, by designers, custom designed uh, haute couture. Um, shoes instruments, instruments of war, um, and architecture. And this is really what we do, and it's uh, uh, that aspect of luxury we really want to focus on. And it even it gets down to the personal aspects of, of our clients uh, and their contexts, the portraits of them, as opposed to a kind of neutral solution for everybody. Um, this is our place. So starting out with quality. Um, quality defined in two ways um, for the sake of our, our discussion. Um, w w one is, uh, two ways somewhere, yeah. The, the degree of excellence, of course, and the second being attributes or characteristics. So we'll go through those. Um, and I wanted to outline quality uh, in the qualities of how luxury architecture has evolved in the last 20 years related to retail. So this is a little case study. Um, that sort of outlines what's happened and how architecture has played a role and how that role has changed. Um, so this is a little set of sketches that kind of we'll quickly go through that explains that. Um, this is um, a display case, it's a counter, where luxury started out uh, previously. Small spaces, uh, five to 10 square meters, where the product and the, and the salesperson were very close and very intimate, uh, which transformed into the corner, 
a store which was essentially within a space, a wall units and, and a display case, still intimate, very thematic in the approach to design, very much deco oriented. And then became the, the boutique, the small store interior project, uh, again generated uh, primarily by decorative themes, um, still intimate, and later the facade that got glued onto that where all of a sudden architecture becomes a, a tool to be used. How can the facade address the street? How can uh, the brand be communicated to the exterior world? And from that, uh, this kind of continual growth in terms of size and in terms of the role of architecture came the flagship store, bigger stores, uh, stores with multiple levels. The stair became a tool. How do we get people to go up? How do we get people to go down? Um, and the facades, where the facades also became two, three level uh, uh, buildings within the urban context that began to communicate the unique qualities of each brand. And then the ominous global store came into being, uh, where those successful flagship stores, which were only in the capitals of the brands, began to expand to all the major cities of the world, and the brands began to proliferate that architecturally with big volumes, independent buildings, um, uh, multiple facades and big spaces, big volumes, where all of a sudden the scales are increasing and the architectural scale, the perception of scale is increasing. And uh, then there's been a backlash to the global store and it's called uh, La Maison, which is this idea of something more intimate, like a house, uh, where uh, the, the customer comes back to luxury, comes back to that specialized one-to-one uh, -one contact, where the spaces are small, um, and the, 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 the product categories can be divided uh, cleanly. Um, so there's a sort of this evolution from small with few people to bigger with more people to large and bigger, more people, and then back to small with few people, but lots of them. So extra large. So there's a kind of a growth, a sort of inclusive uh, phase that architecture has gone through. Um, only in retail and luxury and how, how architectures begin to play a role in, in dealing with that. Another subject uh, in terms of uh, quality is the materials and uh, it's, a, it's a very important subject, uh, materials. There's often people come to us looking for the, the good materials, what are the good materials, what are the new materials and we, we, we spend a lot of effort trying to explain that it's materials are not good or bad, gold is not good, aluminum is not bad, punk uh, concrete is not bad, uh, uh, marble is not good necessarily, it's the good material for the right situation and, and trying to identify uh, how to deal with materials as not ideas. Um, and one project that we've worked on for a Japanese uh, industrialist who owned a forest uh, for his uh, house in Tokyo, kind of a secondary house, we, we had this idea of using wood as a material and this idea of extending the house, uh, the, the, the furniture in his apartment from the floors, like trees extending from the, the forest floor, and, and integrating the architecture or the furniture within the architecture, as opposed to the uh, European model of, of objects within the space, the bed, the dresser, etc. Um, using this idea of extruding wood upwards. And he was very particular in his nature. He liked uh, to lay down everywhere, when he slept of course, but also when he ate and when he read. So he wanted the, the furniture to be in, in, uh, in the shape of his body, in his body exactly. So we took this idea of the extruded wood and shaped it in the different pieces of furniture to his body. Um, and we, we wanted to, uh, to use uh, uh, the wood from his forest, which is a pine wood. And we quickly realized that the wood was too soft. So. Um, we did a lot of experimenting. How can we make soft wood uh, not only soft, uh, harder on the outside, but also stiffer as a, as a material? And there are lots of techniques, um, uh, none of them that are very good, except for one that we discovered, which is the idea of compressing soft wood. So if you take a soft wood, which takes about uh, 20 to 30 years to reach maturity, um, and you compress it in a few hours, you can actually uh, achieve a hardwood, uh, uh, which takes about 80 years to, to reach maturity, depending on the species. Uh, and we were able to, from that, to create, uh, using his uh, wood for his house, for his body, uh, furniture, these pieces of wood that are then sculpted, in this case, where he takes off his shoes to sit down when he walks in the house, to the shape of his body for these, for these elements, uh, the, the, the eating area in the living room 
or the chaise longue in the living room where he lays down. Um, this idea of customizing materials, it, it can be, instead of purchasing material, actually making a material for somebody. Uh, that, that idea of, of luxury, of, of giving identity to the material, so it's not something somebody else can have. And we've done this architecturally also in terms of materials like the wall, in the case of this project for Louis Vuitton in Paris, uh, creating a wall uh, inspired from the monogram, Louis Vuitton monogram, the circle, the flower, and the diamond, um, and uh, aluminum, uh, lots of aluminum. Uh, taking this through a, a very complex process of melting, uh, uh, molding, machining, uh, dipping in copper for the first layer, uh, then dipping in silver, putting uh, uh, blocks on and then dipping in gold, uh, and then having that hand polished, and then having that assemble these diamonds one by one next to each other to create circles, and then to create flowers that are, are then lifted up in, in, to become a wall that lines the entire uh, three levels of the space, and then can be in, in inlaid with crystal, uh, crystals uh, from um, the Czech Republic, leathers, uh, to create different identities along that wall in, in the space. So that wall becomes uh, part of Louis Vuitton's brand. It becomes something that actually inspires their products, uh, that pattern in, in the process of architecture has been inspired from the brand and then has inspired the brand. Um, <coughs> That an another aspect of quality is uh, image and identity, a very important one. Um, the quality of image, and this is again using Vuitton as an example, um, how that, that brand image comes out. In this case, taking the flower uh, and, and, and taking the flowers and, and really producing a sort of field of flowers, uh, flipping that upside down to create a, a ceiling in a space that's a sort of floating mezzanine that leads people up to a sort of private space and the floors above and they're reflective to give a kind of a, a magical edge to them. <laughs> Another example of identity, which can be very simple, uh, a Swiss brand wishing to reinforce uh, that they're Swiss because they're a watch brand, taking that sort of iconic cross from the, uh, from the flag and integrating it into the, the architectural uh, facade of the building. So it can happen on many levels uh, and in many places. Uh, uh, the architecture has a role to play in there. And then also the importance of, of dealing with quality at, uh, at uh, the small scale, the large scale, and the medium scale. At the large scale, um, the identity of a city, in this case a city in the south of Spain called Etija, which uh, <coughs> excuse me, needed a plaza that uh, uh, reignited the, the identity of the city as well as, of course, was a functional tool to create the spaces for the activities that happened there. The idea really to use a sort of undulating surface, in this case of Bourgonvilliers flowers, something indigenous to the area, and in the colors of, of the, the traditions of the area, to create a blanket of these flowers in the plaza uh, that shade the activities below, that protect the residential activities above. And, and you see the, the way it, it, it forms spaces uh, differently for the people who play chess, so the, the groups of, of elderly people, the, the kids area and allows for views through to the iconic elements within the city. So a real emblem for the city, a real, uh, a real identifying feature for them. And then uh, the idea of, of rarity. Um, rarity, uh, rarity. Rarity starts in Darwin, uh, Australia, where if you fly there and then you take a plane two hours uh, northwest uh, into the middle of the ocean and get on a boat, you can uh, eventually find uh, a, a pearl, a South Sea pearl within an oyster. Uh, nothing more rare than that. Um, and this is by a company, a family company called Paspeli, that uh, are fishermen, uh, they're aviators, they're, they're, um, they're mariners, uh, and they're jewelers. And they, <coughs> they produce jewelry for South Sea pearls, the pearl. And how to respect this rarity, how to bring out this rarity for a uh, or creating stores for them was really our task. Um, and the pearl is essentially, as you see in this image, a sphere uh, with a, a lustrous mirror. 
And what we realized in creating this store is that in order to respect the pearl, uh, which is how, how it's treated by the family as a kind of a, a iconic uh, religious uh, element, is to understand what it reflects. And so when you look at it, you're looking at it and, and, and shaping the space around it in order to make it look its best. We realized that there was no lighting for pearls that existed in any kind of qualitative way. Uh, so we had to recreate the lighting, uh, working with an English lighting specialist called Mind's Eye, <coughs> where we went through a numerous different lighting scenarios to try to identify the types of lights, the color temperature of the lighting, the surface of which the lighting is applied, the materials, the, the, the textures of those surfaces, in order to create the, the, the ideal lighting to bring out the pearl, uh, to make this rare element uh, special. We've gone for hours, it's, it's really a relentless process. Um, and then in that showcase, we finally found the combination of lighting which made the pearl the, the best. And we realized now we have to design the store. When you take the pearl out of the showcase to show it to somebody, uh, all of a sudden you're dealing with another context. And so we basically took this sort of microscopic solution for the lighting and expanded it to the scale of the store to also have that quality there. As they're renowned for the best pearls in the world and the best strands in the world, we took that that lighting concept for the idea of the strand to create some depth of scale <coughs> and applied it to the facade where we integrated LED, light, LED lighting of different color temperatures vertically to create a kind of glimmering uh, paspali facade which then in terms of image communicates that paspali equals pearls for those people outside of Australia that don't know that. The second category uh, today is mystery. Sounds very obscure. Um, and it's, it's something that's very important in our work and, and uh, trying to uh, create not illusion in the negative sense but to create something that, that uh, makes people think twice and, and consider things in a different light. Um, and the first, the first subject, illusion, a mystery and illusion, applies really to a project that we did in uh, Roppongi Hills in Tokyo <coughs> where we had to design a store the interior of the store and the facade. And we wanted to render in the, in the need to create some level of exclusivity for the store, a facade which was a kind of mirage, a blurry sort of magical facade. And to do that, we looked at the idea of using a honeycomb material. Um, but we expanded that into large uh, Pyrex glass tubes that are stacked on top of each other that allowed for views in when you look straight on when we looked obliquely, you have something that really captures the light and becomes luminous and a bit, uh, a bit magical. Um, and we did that at a very large scale um, for a multiple story building um, to where we were able to, with 30,000 tubes stacked on top of that, create this sort of huge mirage of a building. Um, and, and here it is. Another aspect of mystery is that, that, that the intangibility of, of seeing something and not being able to really grasp it. Um, and uh, for that reference, we'll use a project in uh, Sao Paulo, a restaurant uh, called Tre Bicchieri, which is Italian for three glasses, owned by uh, three owners who very modest guys, and they wanted to um, uh, make this restaurant together. They wanted somehow to talk about themselves, but not in an overt way. Um, and at the same time, we had to, to, to find a way to nonetheless give them a story to tell in, in their restaurant. So we took the profiles uh, of each of the three gentlemen, the, the facial profiles, and uh, we went to Murano, we made uh, glasses, uh, wine glasses, using the stems of the glasses to replicate the, their profile faces. Um, and then we stacked those glasses on top of each other, uh, alternatingly, to create a facade. Um, and that facade became this sort of tool for us to not only identify these people implicitly in, in their project, but also to become the, the filtering element between the interior of, of their restaurant and the exterior of the street. So people walking by can sort of see inside, but sort of not, and, and vice versa, the people inside are protected from the passers-by. So it became a tool for communications as well as a kind of a blurring of, uh, of that reality. And it's quite magical and it, it, it's quite elusive in the way that it, it catches the light from the inside, uh, outside, but as well as from the, the inside. Reflection. 
Uh, another big part about uh, materials, is it there, is it not there, and these windows into some sort of other reality. Um, and for that, there's a, a project, a museum for watches that we did in Switzerland uh, with, I think, 350 timepieces in a, a rather large space and how to, to deal with that scale change between something very small and something and big and, and, and also to, to work on the, the, the magicalness of watches, watches being uh, this, these two arms under glass that are, that are mechanized magically to tell us time and that space in between the crystal and the, and the face of the watch and how to really capture that architecturally. Um, uh, and at the same time to, uh, to do that in a way that didn't really just involve um, having a bunch of dis different display cases that, uh, uh, that would each have its own uh, object within it. So in order to avoid that, we did uh, one large display case and then we carved out the circulation, a bit the opposite of the, the, the desk project that we looked at earlier. So the, the, the circulation became the void and the, the singular surface uh, of the displays became the display. And so here you have a sort of a, a 360 degrees conical screen above, uh, the, 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 the watch displays below and a timeline wrapping around the space, everything reflecting the light that's uh, coming from the images of the video as well as from the display cases themselves. Uh, using this idea of bringing in ambiguity, bringing in illusion, bringing in mystery, through um, the reflection. So this is a pavement with a puddle, but we see the church reflected in it. What's real? What's a window into another reality? And trying to apply that really to the watch and to create this kind of whirlpool of, 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 of space. So when you walk through here, you're not just looking at a watch. You're, you're almost in a watch, in, in this sort of magical space between the crystal and the face of the watch. Uh, another example of that kind of uh, reflectivity is uh, uh, the headquarters for Escada in Germany. And here we take a pair of pinking shears that are used for cutting fabrics um, mm. with this sort of zigzag edge. And we sort of extrapolated mm. that, that zigzag pattern by shaving it into the carpets, by, by building it into the upholstery of uh, this sort of monumental furniture, um, but also by uh, all of the metal boxes in, in uh, the copper, the, the blue steel, and the stainless steel within the space, linished, polished, and brushed to create this kind of elusive surface uh, for the different functions that happen within. Um, uh, so it's, it's something that's, that's difficult to grasp and at the same time gives a, gives a, a, a qualitative, uh, kind of magical richness that, 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 that responds to who this brand is and who they need to be as an office. And it catches the light and, and delivers the light through reflection um, back and forth. This is a the video. I don't know. It's a video just showing how that that happens. This is a, a video screen that's next to the the wall, and some people walking by in the background. So it like mirrored bars in the space, and uh, it makes for for something quite precious. Um, Another, uh, another aspect uh, that is somehow overlaid here uh, is this, this idea of exclusivity and inclusivity. Very important for luxury brands um, in retail, in, in any case. Uh, luxury meaning exclusive, it's for, for them and not for them because they have the means or they're special, so they're going to spend a lot and, and, and pay attention to a lot to something that's specifically uh, and uniquely for them. But at the same time, there's a desire to have more people. So, how do you create uh, the, this balance between it's special but come on in uh, sort of attitude? And uh, really that was done through this idea of creating these, these boxes uh, with glimmering surfaces and at the same time a, a veil uh, that covers them that it allows the views into the stores and allows people to slip under and, and move into the stores. And the last category is uh, the magic. Um, the magic of the, the architectural uh, projects that, that's really important. It's not, it's not a, a practical tool, but it's something that really comes out from uh, the accumulation of, of very di various different elements, one being light, lighting and movement, um, uh, a key, of course, to any project. And I'll use an example of that for a project that we did in Paris on Avenue Georges V, which is called the BMW uh, uh, Showroom Museum. Um, Georges V is a very famous luxury street in Paris, and this was the existing project. Uh, a rather large facade 
that was highly divided up and we, we tried to simplify it, creating large windows uh, that would allow us to see inside the store. <coughs> and here you see a section where the people driving by can see inside these large windows to the car, but they can also see, thanks to a suspended mirror, a very monumental, very large monumental mirror suspended above the, the car from above, so you have uh, uh, the, the ability to see it from quite far away, creating this kind of stage from the street, uh, uh, from the street, so people driving by can see into these automobiles. So it's it's a bit hard to see because of the reflection here, but you have this large uh, mirror that's reflecting the the top of the cars. Below is a, an LED screen uh, that changes the sort of backdrop of, of each particular car. This is seen from in front, where you see the the, the smaller windows have been replaced by. Uh, very large uh, panes of glass and a, and a large central door. Um, and that mirror then becomes something, <clears throat> not just a tool of communications, but working with a, a German, um, actually in a German-based, Los Angeles-based uh, group of artists called Ubercy, creating a kind of a magical component to that mirror, uh, which is really the idea of pixelized layers of LCD uh, that are then applied onto the mirror in order to be able to be programmed and create movement. So what that means is that you may know that the glass, that uh, when uh, those pieces of glass that are often used for conference rooms, when they're electrified, they become opaque, opaque, uh, and when they're not, they become transparent. Those are used on top of the mirror um, <coughs> to, uh, to create a, a kind of movement, a programmable movement that uh, corresponds to the LED screen below. You can see this sort of angled uh, pattern that that renders this, this monumental feature that not only reflects the car, something a little magical, that responds to uh, the environment that's around. In the case here with a water image on the LED screen, you see the kind of liquidification of this metal facade thanks to these uh, LED screens. So quite magical, and it really does turn people's heads as they walk by, um, because it's it's uh, it's something quite unexpected and and and, and irreal, unreal. Magic in terms of enticing and uh, entrancing. Um, the example we use here is an example that that's a very that's very key for us. Um, I think I lost some slides there. But anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Is the stair, no, it's on the screen, but it, it's the stair. Um, and in, in many of our projects, uh, these are projects with multiple levels, and so um, uh, it's a quite a big investment for people to build a store and then build on a couple levels. And, and often, uh, people visiting uh, stores, only 20% will actually go up or go down. Um, despite the fact that they may have crossed the city to go to that store, to just go to the next level is somehow unattainable. So using the stairs as a tool to, in order to do that is something that we, that we do um, uh, quite, quite uh, differently in many projects. In this case, in Nagoya, using this idea of uh, a double helix stair, which is two stairs wrapped together that then pass through to draw people up um, into the space. Um, as a, as a way of catching people from the two entrances. So they, as they come in, they kind of spiral up to the top. Another example is the stair in the Scotta headquarters where it's kind of come wrapped in this magical metal uh, that makes it something uh, to experience. Or in the case of a, a club in uh, Tokyo, a private club where we actually created a stair where each step was different, meaning the riser as you go up was higher and the, the run was shorter. Um, and uh, it's almost a kind of a flowing ramp and then twisted it around a circular stair uh, so that the people can slide and, and move up underneath it. And it's uh, surprisingly enough, not uh, contrary to popular belief, not at all uh, difficult to, to walk up. Um, and then the escalator in Louis Vuitton, it's a, a 40 second escalator ride uh, with uh, an art installation, uh, fiber optic art installation on the wall. Uh, that, that's the only place in the store uh, where there's no product that changes uh, with different art interventions. And then simply applying a, a polished layer of stainless steel to the riser to create the kind of illusion of a, of, of, of a stair that's, uh, that's elusive 
where people can uh, walk up and, and, and be a bit scared at the same time. And using that riser in a way that's um, also uh, with an image, in this case uh, uh, a video image, uh, but making the stair in stone so it still remains something luxurious by using fiber optics that are actually uh, penetrating through the stone every nine millimeters, uh, six millimeters, uh, like spaghetti, that are then lit uh, on the ends to project an image through the stair. So you're walking up the stair and you don't understand because there's no shadow. How is that image there? Um, and that image changes. Uh, another in video. It shows how that, that's programmed for different seasons and different collections. And it's something people want to try. So then instead of being a barrier, it becomes something that uh, is enticing. And then seduction, um, uh, the magic of seduction. It's, uh, it's applied to a project in Brazil, uh, the capital of seduction. Um, the, uh, in Brazil, the shopping centers uh, are places that are equivalent to European uh, urban uh, shopping streets. Uh, because of the weather, because of the, the, the security problems, uh, everything happens within shopping centers. People eat there, people uh, read uh, by their books there, they get their hair done there. Uh, they meet their friends there, and uh, they spend the day, essentially. Um, and in designing a shopping center uh, that opened recently in uh, Sao Paulo, uh, we decided to sort of apply this, this uh, concept of interaction. In interviewing the, the people in Brazil, um, which was really new to me culturally, uh, about what, what is it that you like about the, this shopping center, because it's kind of a famous uh, place. Uh, and the common response is, we like to go there um, it wasn't surprisingly to shop or to, to, to have dinner, it was to look at the beautiful people. And um, uh, so we tried to use this sort of Parisian model of, of seats that are faced outwards where the people can look out and watch the people and integrate it into the edges of the openings of the voids in the shopping center uh, by extending very large uh, six meter long uh, solid travertine benches uh, where the people can uh, can sort of uh, watch the other folks around and, and it's it's quite well used uh, to make phone calls as well as to uh, to watch the the people and then finally the the exceptional um, in, in some projects uh, there's the opportunity to do something that uh, really stands out that, that locks in the memory of of the experience and stays with you um, that's not necessarily directly about any functional thing like it's displaying a bag um, and the example we use there is for the project we designed in Louis Vuitton uh, for the Champs Elysees, uh, which is an atrium. Originally, we designed a project that was kind of a kind of an inverted Guggenheim, where you you walk down a series of ramps, take the escalator up, and then um, wake, make your way down without having to go into an elevator. But in the core of this space is a six-story atrium, um, and it was an opportunity to really do something exceptional and spectacular. Uh, so we took the atrium and we extended. Uh, stainless steel polished rods from the ceiling in the in the form of a half a dome so it's a curved half dome and it sort of shaved off the ends of the rods, uh, rods to, to uh, really shape that space and then we put a mirror on the wall on the opposite side Oops, it's not, not showing it here. Basically, to, uh, to complete that dome. So there's a sort of perception there. Uh, there's a perception of a, a complete sort of centralized element, despite the fact that half of it is virtual, through this sort of ominous sort of Damocles swords and 2000 hanging above your head. Here you see a picture during the construction where on the left side uh, you have the rods, and the right side you have a, a the six-story wall of polished stainless steel completing the perception of that space. There's a view from above during the daytime with the natural light. And uh, that's, that's all I have for you today. I hope that was uh, interesting.